2023. Welcome uh, to members of the of this back to this evening's hybrid meeting. Welcome to those joining us online and also to officers, guest presenters and observers in the room and a warm welcome to those that are viewing the live stream on YouTube. I am Councillor Natalia Perez and I have the pleasure of chairing this meeting this evening. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notices for you. Please wait for me to prompt you before speaking. We have officers, external guests and observers here this evening, both in person and online. When invited to speak, please introduce yourself and tell us who you are representing for the benefit of those viewing online. Please um, help yourself to tea and coffee and some biscuits at the back. Uh, the heating is on. I hope you're feeling okay for the temperatures. Um, if you need a comfort break, there are facilities located by the lifts. Uh, we're also not expecting there to be a fire alarm test this evening. But if the fire alarm uh, does go off, then uh, we have to follow the, the, these instructions. So if the fire alarm sounds either continuously or intermittently, I will adjourn the meeting. Please leave the meeting in an orderly fashion by the nearest exit, which is in the lift lobby and down the stairs. Don't use the lifts. Don't stay behind to collect personal belongings. Officers will direct you to assembly point in Shorelands Road. If you can't use the stairs, fire evacuation officers will escort you to a refuge area and wait uh, with you for further instruction. Evacuation chairs and train operatives are available should an evacuation of all areas become necessary. Thank you. Let's move on then to um, agenda item number one. Apologies uh, for absence. Chair, there are no apologies. Uh, we have apologies for absence uh, from Councillor Lloyd Harris. Um, and we have Councillor quickly joining us online. And we have apologies uh, for um, uh, uh, Keith Allison, who will be leaving the meeting early. Do we also have uh, apologies from Victoria? Uh, Victoria Bigman, yes, yes, yes. We also have apologies from Victor Bergon. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item number two um, and declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? No? Great. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to please request members to vary the order of business as uh, there's much to get through and support our finance colleagues during this cycle. So I would like to suggest that, first of all, we uh, look at item number six, palliative care update, and then agenda item number seven, uh, the medium-term financial strategy, followed by agenda item number four, public health update, then agenda item number five, public health emergency planning update, and finally, we look at the minutes. We all in agreement? Great. Thank you very much. Um, so let's start with um, agenda item number six, palliative care, model of care working group update. So this is in response to an action requested by the committee. Uh, and this report provides an update uh, from the model of care working group arising from uh, the presentation to the committee back in July. And this evening we have with us Philippa Johnson, Dr. Lindsay Williams, uh, Jane Wheeler, and we also have uh, Michelle, let's have at the back. Yes. Hello, good evening, and David Harmon. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, welcome all. Thank you very much, Councillor Perez. So many around this room are, are very aware of the background to this work. And so much as we want to keep this update focused on um, the particular questions answered, if, if you bear with us to give about five minutes of background of where we're at, um, I'll start. My name's Jane. I'm the programme director for one of the Northwest London ICB's transformation programmes, which covers a, a variety of areas, but particularly obviously relevant today is palliative care. And then I'll hand over to my two colleagues who'll introduce themselves and give some of the other elements of the work we're picking up um, through this review process. So I was really struck waiting outside with one of the commitments of this council around doing with residents and not doing to residents. And that's really been important to us in how we approach this work. And the model of care group that you gave reference to has been set up to be an equal combination of um, clinicians and managers within the service and also residents from across our eight boroughs. And, and that's been 
tremendously valuable in terms of getting that balance of views, both the kind of clinical perspective and the real sense from a, the ground up of what those needs are and, and sharing that and coming to the best, best kind of outcome. And clearly, I know what you want to hear is that we have a solution now in terms of how we can um, serve the needs of people who need specialist inpatient beds from these community, but also wider boroughs as well, where we've got suspended services. And you'll know from the papers, we don't have that answer now. It's a real tension through this work to carry on listening to views, doing that in the boroughs, doing that at Northwest London and moving at pace to come to a decision. And that's a tension we are really, really aware of. And I think what we have decided and what our view is that making sure that people are engaged and with us and have the opportunity to input trumps the need for pace but I'm really happy we have that debate with you and others as we continually do in our central team about kind of what those needs are and how quickly we can get to plug some of the gaps and of course those gaps are informed by the specific ask that you put to us last time what are we doing about the kind of um, modeling of need and what that looks like and what are we doing to better understand the workforce and the gaps so you'll see in the paper some of the work we've done to date on both those elements but there's also a trailer that we know that there's more to do and there's really three chunks more work we need to do across those those areas the firstly is looking at demand and really being able to map out that future trajectory of demand across the different boroughs and across different um, age groups and population needs we have some quite crude numbers in here of total numbers of increased demand we expect to see over the next five to ten years but we really need to break that down in a much more granular way to communities so that's one you know another bit of analysis that we need to do more work on that obviously then links to understanding the workforce. We know that we have nationally and in London and of course in our patch of London real challenges around workforce. We met with many of the hospices earlier and not in your local patch but one of them saying they feared that their workforce next year could have up to 70% gaps. You know there is a huge challenge outside of outside of our control. Really exciting opportunities though. Maybe people know that across northwest London there's a, a recruitment day sucking in our hospitals and our community providers providers coming up and the hospices are now going to be part of that. So we're really trying to think a bit more differently about how we support the palliative care sector to address those workforce challenges. We did want to bring a much more of a Hammersmith and Fulham lens for you around that workforce. The real challenge is a number of our contracts don't just exist for Northwest London and Hammersmith and Fulham. They also cover other boroughs south of the river and of course into north central London and so doing a, a realistic breakdown is something that we're struggling to do and what I don't want to do is put sort of um, so um, aggregated or uh, numbers which have so many assumptions to be meaningful meaningless in front of the committee so we do want to do a bit more work around what that overarching workforce gap is but it sort of links also to doing that first modelling around need and then the third bit of analysis that we need to pick up is really understanding the sort of travel planning element what does it really mean in terms of how how people access physically access services and we've agreed with the model of care groups and principles about how we do that looking at both road travel buses public transport and um, looking at number of times of day we, we're slightly stuck for a while in terms of the bus route changes coming in because get not without getting too technical the system you need to use to do that mapping hasn't yet been updated for changes that are coming in so those three bits of analysis analysis should help us understand the need in the local area and also how we can relate our emerging model of care to that Lindsay's going to talk about some of the flavor of that model of care at the end but I'm going to hand over to Philippa right now to update on a couple of other areas Oh, OK. Thank you. Sorry, pressing the wrong bit. Um, so hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm Philippa Johnson. I'm the Director of Operations for um, Central London Community Healthcare, or CLCH, um, and we are the provider of the specialist palliative care um, provision uh, to the inner boroughs, uh, and that includes the Pembridge unit. So the, um, the Pembridge inpatient unit, uh, day services and uh, community specialist palliative care team. Um, I have two hats because I also am the um, director of the um, borough-based partnership in Hammersmith and Fulham and co-chair the partnership with, with Lisa. Um, so I've uh, wanted to just flag a couple of things really in terms of um, those two roles. So for, with my CLCH hat on as the provider of specialist palliative care, um, the Pembridge inpatient unit is still suspended as, as you all know um, and it was suspended because of lack of consultant cover 
um, and that still remains the case. We did try to recruit, we've tried uh, several times, um, and we also tried, it's uh, uh, in the report, um, to collaborate with uh, Acute Trust and other hospice providers to see if we could come up with a solution where we spread the resource um, across the units and came up with a solution for the Pembridge inpatient unit. But unfortunately, um, we didn't get to a place where we could do that um, without destabilising other units. So it still remains the case. And obviously, in the context of the Northwest London Review, recruiting into um, that team would be a really difficult challenge. So that uh, remains the case. The good news is the day hospice is open and it's uh, it's opened this week um, and so we would be um, getting fully up to speed with the day hospice provision. We have been providing over the pandemic as it's set out in the report with virtual support and some outpatient clinics but the day hospice proper um, is, is now open. Um, the other uh, thing to flag really is around uh, community nursing. So obviously we have the inpatient unit and the uh, nurses that provide the specialist palliative care in the community. So go into people's homes um, and that activity from the specialist palliative care community team um, has been up by about 20% set out in the report, which means more care at home by the specialist palliative care community team, but also to flag the district nurses and community matrons who provide a lot of the care and the, and the bread and butter really in terms of end of life care. Um, activity is up as well. So um, I think the good news on that front is that people's needs are being met in their own home with the resource that we currently have. And I know that's not the same as having the inpatient beds open, but um, that's our current state. And then with my other hat on, I just wanted to uh, touch on a couple of points. So um, we've had really, really good engagement in the borough-based partnership with all partners and um, with our colleagues uh, in Hafson, Jim and Merrill and um, uh, uh, other lay members that have really helped us think about how we communicate with uh, local residents, how we really understand needs and uh, some of those events are set out in the pack, we have an active um, work stream and end, uh, end of life work stream, um, which has got uh, partners, lay reps, um, uh, voluntary sector engagement in that work stream. And with working with working with local residents and partners, um, we really um, came to the conclusion that we're real two real priorities set by the group. Uh, which we're working on very actively. And one of those was a directory of local, local provision and local care and what was available from voluntary sector or partners or statutory sector. Um, and that is very close to uh, completion. So that piece of work is coming together. Um, and then the second piece was really about um, joined upness, I would call it. So how um, uh, care provision through adult social care and the community nursing fits together so that um, for people in their own homes are getting a really joined up experience. And as we know, that isn't always the case. So um, a piece of work with adult social care colleagues and community nurses really working together to say, how do you, how do you join up that care? How do you make mess? make best use of those interventions so the, the person receiving the care feels like it's holistic and sensible and they don't fall between gaps or people are saying no that's not my job um, so that's a very active piece of work as well and then finally I know there was um, a conversation at the last meeting around uh, support to carers and Councillor Quigley who I can see on screen um, asked about um, could we do some work with carers to support carers to um, to have a bit more support in the home fr from the specialist teams and, and equip them and um, probably, uh, you know, do a better job at, at joining up and supporting carers. And we've recognised that in the partnership. So there's a general recognition about um, how we support carers across the borough generally, not just necessarily end of life. And we've got um, some work to do in the partnership and that's in our forward plan. But we've also got um, a, um, a contact from the um, end of life carers network who is working with the end of life 
work stream and I think probably a suggestion from that piece of work is to join up with Councillor Quigley and apologise for not reaching out earlier um, but to join that up really and um, and connect you into that conversation so that we're looking at uh, the expert carers the experts because you you uh, through experience um, and and the professionals that are working in that space and just work out what we need to do and how we can support carers better. So I think that's everything I wanted to say and I'll hand over to Lindsay. Thank you. Um, so I'm Dr Lindsay Williams, I'm a GP by background, um, so I mostly work in Brent uh, and the outer boroughs um, uh, and a little bit over in Kent and Chelsea, so I haven't worked in Hampstead and Fulham, but we work really closely with clinical leads in every borough so especially during the COVID pandemic um, we reached uh, we created a little forum where all the clinical leads all the GPs for end of life and palliative would all come together and share information and we are going to reignite that again um, we had a little hiatus in that so um, for those that don't know me hi I sit with colleagues on the Northwest London last phase of life program and as part of that program this review is part of a multiple other work streams. And this review has been probably the most engagement I think I've ever had with members of the public. So I've, I'm a Macmillan GP. Um, I've been doing that since 2017. Um, I've worked with the London End of Life Clinical Network and I've never had so much engagement. And it's for me, it's changed the, it's put us in a different place with the review. We previously were focusing on what services we had and how we could um, how we could slot patients into those services. And now saying that out loud, that sounds ridiculous, but that's where we were at. Whereas now we're looking at the patient's journey and the patient's needs, and then what services can wrap around them. And that's the different position we're in. And I have to say that came about from, so I co-chair with Jane, the model of care working group, which is on a weekly basis, which has been going since June. Jane mentioned we have 12 members of public on that with lived experiences or care experiences. And they've they helped us change that, that narrative of what we're looking at now. And the the opportunity here is it's it's actually bigger than one inpatient unit. It's actually looking at what what are the needs right now, but what are the future needs, as Jane mentioned. Um, and what what do our residents actually want? Um, and what we're hearing and from all the engagement we've done thus far, and it's continuing, that this is the other beauty of this piece of work that we're doing is we always do a piece of engagement, we close the door and then we push on with something. Whereas this is ongoing engagement um, and we continue to get emails and messages and I and our team respond to them personally when we get in, in any kind of contact at all. Um, we have a whole team of focusing on engagement. Um, and so for us, I guess it's it's been a long piece of work, but actually a really rewarding piece of work because we've already identified quick wins where, for example, we've increased 24-7 uh, access to pharmacy for uh, anticipatory medications. We've um, implemented the, the MAR chart, which is used to prescribe and record anticipatory medicines in end of life. We've got 24-7 telephone advice now for all professionals across all of Northwest London. Um, and you know, for, particularly for yourselves in Hammersmith and Fulham to make it relevant to yourselves, you, we recognize you don't have a hospice at home. And that's actually very inequitable to the other boroughs in Northwest London. And actually that's something that we could put in place sooner rather than later. So I think there's opportunity. And what I'm seeing is for me, I'm seeing what can we do right now and we need to have this laid out. So this is ongoing, but as this iterative, as these weekly meetings happen, we identify what can we change now? What can happen now? What can we do? And then we peel off and we do a task and finish group and we get something going. Um, I'm a bit of a doer and, and that's why I think that we've got um, a bit of momentum with this. So um, I think that that was it really, because I know we want to move on with, with questions, but... Um, I'm, you know, we'll happily take any other questions related to anything. Thank you very much um, for the report, for the update, and thank you very much for um, the information this evening. It's it's good to hear about the engagement opportunities and activities and that focus on patient, the patient's journey and the patient's <laughs> needs and that regular ongoing conversation uh, that can um, generate changes so so quickly. 
Uh, okay, let's move to questions. Thank you. Um, I visited uh, Trinity, uh, Royal Trinity Hospice before Christmas to one of their events because my partner sadly died there. And I was, I mean, I was just overwhelmed at the dedication which that team put in, their, their really hard work. But Philippa mentioned recruitment and what worried me looking at the, the, the dedication there is what provision is made for um, staff well-being? Because I'm conscious that, you know, that sort of high traumatic workload could lead to sort of burnout. And what support do you give the staff in, in all your care homes and the ones dealing with end of care? Because I think if we're facing staff shortages, you know, we need to re to retain staff and, re and recruit staff. And it it's important that staff welfare is, is paramount. Thank you. Philippa, I think we'd probably need to check with Royal Trinity in terms of the specifics of that, that offer. But do you want to talk a bit from a, a provider perspective within the NHS, Philippa? Yes, thank you. So, um, yeah, so uh, staff health and wellbeing is is right at the top of our agenda um, as, a, as an employer. And, you know, we've seen through COVID, it's, it's never been more important, really. Um, and people have worked so hard for so long. Um, it, it's... It's absolutely paramount. So we do have a whole program of work of um, staff health and well-being. We have well-being webinars. We have um, individual one-to-ones and supervision. And on every supervision, there should be a conversation about health and, and well-being. Um, we have a flexible working policy as well, so people can um, apply for flexible working if they've got needs of their own that they need to work through. Um, so there's a whole raft, and I'm sure you know every NHS provider is, is has a whole raft of um, initiatives really for staff health and wellbeing. You know, I think ultimately, is it ever enough? Um, I think the only way we know that is by really asking staff. We do do an annual staff survey, which the whole NHS does, um, and uh, staff morale. Um, is a big feature in that as well. So we do measure it. We do a pulse survey uh, every quarter as well, um, and we have um, a we have a well-being task and finish group um, with participants from right across the workforce as well. So I think in answer to the question, there's a whole raft of things, and uh, you know, really happy to delve deeper into that if more information was required. Thank you, uh, Jim. Oh, thanks. Um, th th that was extremely interesting. I must say, first of all, what a pleasure it has been working with Philippa and her team at a borough level, gathering information, um, looking at questions which came from the public, of which we're part ourselves. And many of us actually do have um, considerable experience of looking after people at the end of their lives, family members and others. Reading through the the paper here, it's much amplified in a very welcome way from the previous paper. At the end of it, though, I've got several kinds of questions which come up, which I think need further work. Uh, once in staffing, and Keith is quite right about staffing, staff burnout if people are overworked. Staff shortage means staff are overworked. That's inescapable. But we're planning something going forward, not for next year or even up to 27, which is mentioned a couple of times in the paper, but we actually have uh, what look like good demographic figures up to 40. That's not very far away. And I think one thing we need to do in terms of demand, and that's crucial because this is about the public, we all die, um, it's a fairly clear notion based on current evidence of what the kind of demands will be for end of life care at 40. Whatever we put in place now will be there, good, better, and different for a long time. But there also needs to be with that, this is something we've asked for several times, to be a developmental map for staff 
else we'll find ourselves all of the time doing sticking plate uh, uh, plaster advertising recruitment drives at the last minute. That really isn't what we want. Um, planning going forward in the NHS needs to look at a realistic time span. Uh, there is a second aspect which was mentioned several times. It's mentioned in the papers very often, and that's about lack of joined up thinking. Now, reading the papers closely, it's fairly clear there's a lot of informal work goes on between GPs, for example, at particular trusts, particular hospices. But what there isn't is a, a non siloed approach to this. So there's a seamless uh, connection between patient, carers, if people have carers, uh, local authority nursing systems, the uh, NHS end of life staff, acute care, and GPs. And without that, one is actually improvising at all times. And that's actually what's happening, as we well know. That's uh, what people weren't rumbling about services. We know everybody works hard, but there isn't a will to get out of the silos. Now, there actually is a one thing which I think is unmissable, looking at the really useful charts about where people die, and they're going to be broken down further on inequalities. Uh, mortality rate, and I suspect of the recently mentioned excess deaths that the research groups of the King's Fund and Marmot are talking about, uh, will be concentrated, not entirely, but largely in poor communities. And we're still looking at not being able to find somebody or Pembridge in the poorest district of Northwest London. If that can be done, there's, it's very hard to take the inequalities aspect seriously. Uh, uh, there was much mention on Friday about Marmot. I want to reread it again at the weekend. It's a grim 75 pages plus appendices. And he points out that taking institutions out of deprived communities leads to further mental health, um, lack of morale in the community, and excess mortality. So a creative system working between the components needs to be found to keep Pembridge and places like that open. And my final point is demand going forward. And about piece 30 onwards, um, you mentioned that the number of people dying in 2040 on current projections um, was way up. But the 85 plus lot, uh, some of us will get there soon, we hope, um, are, are the largest lot. It seems to me that you need to be thinking uh, very much about frailty, frailty staffing, specialist conditions, the kind of nursing care people need in a context, the paper points out, Increasing number of us have no families in this country. I'm one. We don't have people we can draw on to look after us. That changing street um, patterns mean you can't call on neighbors anymore. That kind of thing needs to be built in. And I like the notion of families, but for those who haven't got families in this country or in this city, that doesn't, doesn't help at all. And we increase the number of people like myself on that. One little thing I think you need to add, it's, it's mentioned in passing, but not worked on, dementia. That's got its own significance towards end of life. Roughly, NHSC has got good figures on dementia growth. It's frightening. It's large. It will need specialist staffing. It's not the same as just getting old where one's body fails, but one's mind remains intact. Those need to be built into final planning, and they need to be built into areas. Rent is not Hounslow, which is not H&F. And we need those demographics before we come to a final decision. Else, we will have people working harder, and you work hard as it is. But that isn't the problem. We actually need a somewhat different system than the very siloed system we currently have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Would you like to 
I don't think there's anything there that we could disagree with. Uh, and I don't think there's anything there that hasn't been flagged in our model of care group. And I think there's some really important um, emphasis that we need to give. I think the dementia point has, has come out, but maybe we need to more overtly talk about how we meet that different set of needs. So I don't know if you want specific responses to the different points, because really, I think we recognise the need to do that demographic analysis and the other points raised. All I have to say, because it should go into the minutes, is that when the final paper comes back to us and to the public, uh, there needs to be strategies, not aspirations, but strategies built in as to how you're actually going to deal in practice for now and in the next few years to deal with those questions because they will not go away. And we have an opportunity now to plan for the medium long term and rather than put it off and have trouble later, best tackle it now. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you very much. I think, Meryl, do you want to make a contribution as well in relation to this point? Yes. Yes, would you like to join us, please? Yeah. Question. Please go ahead, asking your question. Thank you very much. Meryl Hammer, Secretary of Hammersmith and Fulham Save Our NHS. I will try not to repeat what Jim may have already said. Um, I, Jane, I was interested in your three more chunks. I think one thing I'd say is that when the working group was set up, it was originally going to meet over summer and the report was going to come out in early September. So some of us who were not going to be around over summer opted out of continuing engagement. Mm -hmm. And I think that's unfortunate because, because there were a number of us, including two of us here in this room, who actually were strong contributors in that pre-summer period. So I say that with, with a degree of dismay, I suppose, because we were strong contributors. We went to all, all or virtually all the meetings around Pembridge. We went to those meetings that had, that looked at you know, those, I've forgotten what they were called, the analysis things where we talked about them and came to conclusions about what we didn't know or what we might know and so on. So I think, I think there's been a loss of some resident engagement in the process because you had that main, it was going to be over summer and only those who could be available every week over summer actually volunteered. Um, so, so I was, as someone that was disappointed and who hasn't seen any reports since then, and I think that's the other thing, that there hasn't been any sort of real updating of people in that intervening period. Sorry, Meryl, thank you very much. So in relation to this point, my question to you is, are there further opportunities uh, for engagement so can I take the points in the opposite order, if that's OK, because there has been since the summer a couple of reports which have been published in terms of um, giving an update based on the engagement we've been doing, but also the stage we're at in terms of model of care development. So I'm really sorry that if those have not been shared widely enough, because I think it is really unhelpful to get radio silence and what we have wanted to do was make sure those updates. So. We'll, we'll look again at how we're disseminating those kind of updates because clearly they're a bit of a trigger for feedback, aren't they, when you put something out for those who aren't sitting around the table every week. I would have really liked us to conclude this work over the summer because it would have given us all the, the, um, the answers that I think we all want and ability to move forward both in the short term and the medium and long term. And this has taken longer than I think any of us anticipated. For those who do sit in those model of care groups, they we are not progressing in an entirely linear way. Sometimes as we move to the next topic, we find it reopens questions on a previous week's conversation in terms of the interfaces and ensuring that we're not talking about bits of the surface in a service in a siloed way. So absolutely our intent in a very structured way was to run a process over the summer. And it's taken us a lot longer. Um, I don't want to make a commitment that everybody can join the model of care group because there is also something about the fact that the people who are sitting around the table are the people who've heard the previous week's conversations and there that we can build on it. And I think that is quite important. However, I'm also think what we don't want is a process that is excluding of both people who were very active 
previously and really great ideas. So I, I don't want to give an answer now because I don't know quite how to square those two things, but um, really hear what you're saying about a risk that we're excluding people because it's taking us longer than we intended. So can we come back to you on that? Can I accept that? I've got one other really important point, if you don't mind, Chair, and that is about travel. I have seen your report on travel. I have heard comments about travel. I mean, we do have people that have been going to the meetings. And I'm deeply concerned that the travel issues are going to be dealt with in a rather bureaucratic way instead of looking at what the reality is going to be for people who are trying to visit um, loved ones who might be family, who might just be friends, but loved ones who are nearing the end of life. I think one thing you might like to look at is the orthopedic centre and what they have done about travel. They approached it, it seems to me, from the way you've talked about looking at population groups and bus maps and and they were slated for it because it didn't relate to patients' travel experiences. And I think that's hugely important. Indeed, it must be even more important when you're talking about visiting people who are dying. What you've got to get at are people's real travel experiences and and that may mean looking as the um orthopedic center uh we understand looking at how special transport can also be organized if you are going to continue to look at provision which we would be unhappy about for all the reasons we've argued about before or argued um, for local provision, but if you're going to go for provision that is outside the area, then how people travel is going to be absolutely crucial to the patient and to those families and friends. Thank you very much, Meryl. Very quick response. I know the press for time. So um, I think the, the last point around uh, Funding travel for patients is absolutely not off the table. And so that needs to be part of our planning in terms of if that's a mitigating factor in terms of access. And we know often the travel will be about family members and those who support as much as it is the, the individual patient. And that's something we've considered. I, I agree with Meryl Plus. I think you do need to do the um the quantifiable travel mapping in terms of that, but you also need to be able to look at the kind of experiential element. I don't think one negates the other. And I think how you do the second bit can often build on the first, i.e. when you've got some of the data, it's about how you bring that alive. Nearly everybody in this room will have traveled to be here. We've all traveled to Royal Trinity at various points. We're all, you know, there is a set of experiences that we need to build in, but I don't think that negates the need to, to do the data-driven approach as well, which we can then add another layer of, of real experience on top of. Thank you. Uh, Lucia, you want to take a question and then I'm going to end Hi, Lucy Boddington. Um, I just wanted to sort of just follow on from Jim. And I don't want to repeat what Jim's already said, but I do agree that um, you talk about five years. I know you say five, 10 years, but you are talking about 2027. Um, and, you, the, you know, the reality is if, if there is going to be such a huge increase um, in deaths by 2020, 2040, there needs to not only be the staff, but also um, you need to talk about the beds, the financing, none of that is here. Um, and and the, the other issue is um, about Pembroke Centre. Pem is it Pembroke, Pembroke, Pembroke Centre? Again, again, when is it going to open? I mean, it, you know, again, we would like to open it. It's not saying when it will open. And that's not re really very reassuring. And and, and I understand it's, it's uh, uh, dependent on staff, but, you know, all of this is dependent on staff and future planning. So I know that what you want is a commitment 
to a date when we'll be able to open Pembridge. But that would also be at this stage a false promise that that is the only option that we should be looking at. It's not that it's not an option that we're looking at and we need to work out what would need to be true to enable that to happen, which uh, so far we haven't been able to make those things true. But I think we also need to look at what the other options are so that the risk you've got right now that you don't have um, inpatient care for patients who have both complex needs and more routine um, deaths that we're able to mitigate those needs. So we can't do the finances and we can't do that detailed planning until we've agreed what that ideal model is, which then looks at where we can use money most effectively. We've had a really good example over the last years, if we can take anything positive around what it means to provide more care in people's homes. Now there's been risks around that in terms of the pressures on family and carers, and we shouldn't negate those. But actually, we've seen a huge increase in the amount of support going into people's homes. Clearly, and we give reference to this, there are a set of people who either don't want to or can't stay at home at that time of death. And we need to make sure we're addressing that in the broadest of senses, because we know many of those people do currently die in hospital. So we're not just talking about the difference between being in your own home, which may be a care home, being in a hospice, in an inpatient bed. We've also got to reflect the people who we know through the data are dying in hospital and don't want to. And so there's a much wider flow of how all of that need to redesign in an unsiloed way, not to quote that again, can really do something that is better from 2027. And it's going to take us till 2027 to implement any big changes we make. You know, either there is a, a timeline in of staffing challenges for doctors and nurses, and then can be sustainable for a good number of years as we see that demand increasing. What we don't necessarily have a good projection on is whether that demand is for the more complex needs, i.e. needing 24-7, needing doctor-led care, or if it is for those cohort of people, sorry, that's a horrible phrase, cohort of people, if it is for those needs, which you might describe as more routine, but needing some support, needing that safety net and needing to know that they've got that when they need it. So I can't give you the answer you want. I think it is honest of us to keep working up different options which reflect the challenges we've had to date reopening Pembridge rather than being solely focused on that which we might not be able to pull off and that's the reality of keeping the options open so we can maximize the opportunity to benefit Hemel Smith and Fulham residents the hospice at home is a really great example you are the only borough without that service and we need to fix that as soon as we can against a backdrop of at this stage not making substantial service change pending the need potentially for a consultation so I'm um, sorry I've, I've I've gone off track there with my response but I, I can't give you the very solid answer you want I'm afraid. Thank you now I can invite uh, Councillor Coleman. Hello nice to see you again. Um, First of all, general comment, um, which is about how you've gone about this, uh, which I have to say is great. Uh, this is, it's as we were, we were seeing a little bit of each other recently at the ICP meeting, Integrated Care Partnership meeting, had a big workshop the other day, and our local health and care partnership had a, also a brilliant workshop um, to yesterday only. And what's really noticeable about this paper, and if I can just draw a general point for the integrated care system and the partnership, is the way that um, it was originally developed was possibly a case study in how not to do it. Uh, I remember going to a town hall event at uh, Kensington um, and Chelsea with probably 100 people there yelling at well-meaning people trying to develop, were you, were you one of the well-meaning people, Philip, trying to develop the um, original uh, paper because it was being done without sufficient reference to people whether you call them patients or people. And it was catastrophic and nobody trusted the NHS. Then came COVID and you used the opportunity to regroup, rethink and do a much, uh, almost a model, uh, take a model approach that you're taking now, which I hope is going to be the way that the ICS does everything um, with patients, with people. I'm, I say, you know, I have this big thing about patients. You shouldn't be a patient unless you're ill. But anyway, with people and really co-producing it. So I'm, um, Top marks, realizing you got it wrong, picking up and putting some model for the ICS for the future. I think that's that's excellent. Just a couple of points on what's been raised and something that occurred to me. Um, Jim raised so many interesting points, as Jim does. I always found myself agreeing strongly with his first two points and then wishing I had a note for all the other ones. Um, maybe when the notes of the meeting come out, it would be interesting actually to have an answer, which I think you were touching on, to each of the points he raised. Um, I'd also like to endorse the uh, point that Merrill raised, particularly about transport. 
And we are pushing very hard in the orthopedic service consultation for there to be proper transport, both for people receiving the services and people visiting them. And I think if we are going to start talking in a, on a North London scale, Northwest London scale, where we have this, forgive me, ridiculous 2.3 million people um, size to cover and all the way from you know the tip of Westminster, the tip of Hillingdon, uh, we are, and we are going to start trying to have services in particular places, places, places of excellent, it will not work unless you're offering free transport of some sort, and I'm not talking about ambulances, I'm talking about, um, you might call, um, we we brought in, when we brought in transport, when, well, when the Conservatives, we inherited the administration from brought in transport for disabled children, it was a catastrophe because they hadn't thought about the care aspects. And when we redid the contract, which took us a lot of time, it was all about care and transport. So yes, you could use taxi firms, but as long as it's care, that they understand. But I really think this is such an incredibly important point, again, generic, not just about palliative care, but about providing free transport. So people themselves who are getting the care, and in the case of palliative care, their loved ones, their friends can, can visit them. I'm very uh, appreciate, I appreciate very much you drew out the need to do something about the lack of hospice at home in Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, and I also think it's important that the um, Pembridge is it's very much live. We, I think if it closes and it never comes back, I mean, there is a certain amount of slight skepticism in the room that we still can't find anyone to do it. And I guess the question is, you know, I know you're doing lots of work, so maybe while the work's going on, how hard are you looking? And to you decide it's to um, whether or not to keep it. But I think there's going to be just politically here and in our neighbouring borough, a, a bit of a stink if it closes, I'm just warning you, Whereas, which would be a shame given the quality of what I know you're working on and producing. Final point I wanted to make, if I may, is is the question in the paper you say what is an absolutely fundamental question? Not just an model of care that you look at. Well, what is the, what is the when you say what is the model of care that you want? And I thought that what we'd say is there'd be a simple statement which says that people should die in the location of that dying in the location of cutting in and out. Hang on. People should have the option of dying in the location of their choosing. So it might be a hospice, it might be a home, it might be a hospital. I don't see that explicitly here. I see a statement that says the new model of care will aim to make sure people have a choice, get the right care at the right time by the right team. Now, your definition of the right care is going to be much more expert than mine, but my idea of the right care might be it's in my house. So I think we need to be and, and in the right place. It says and in the right place alongside alongside their wishes and preferences. And all residents, no matter the circumstances, will be able to access the services they need. I think you need to be more explicit. If you mean that people will be will have a choice of where they die, they would look at the location of where they are supported to die, be that at home or hospice or hospital. I think you should spell it out because that's what that's the standard. I mean, if you read anything that Marie Curie or Macmillan or anyone put out, that's a standard phrase that anyone in the um, this world would 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 welcome. Um, and um, I also welcome the fact that um, you, you say that resident, picking up the point that Merrill made, all residents, no matter their circumstances, will be able to access the services. And I see that as a positive sign for the free transport that I've just uh, mentioned. So looking forward to the next iteration. Thank you. Just a couple of very quick response, if I may, Councillor Perris. So um, in terms of people being able to die in their place of choice, that is a really important principle nationally and locally. Of course, we know that that often changes in terms of people want through um, their journey. And of course, we also have to recognise that there is a degree of needs reflected in that. So um, everybody may want to die in a hospice bed not everybody needs the wraparound services that are provided in a hospice bed and we have to be honest about that that actually hospice is inpatient hospice units are set up to provide a really complex multi-professional pain management support to a set of people who have really complex needs we would not even get close to having that workforce for anybody who wanted to be in a hospice and so I think there's a really important and, and some of the conversation the model of care group about those needs based if there are people who want to die somewhere which is not in their own home not in hospital not in a care home but don't have that set of needs for that full multi-professional team how do we make sure that's supported and it's really important in terms of people who don't have family to make sure that that option is in place but I think we've never talked about what that 
looks like. We've talked a lot about um, a consultant led and we got very fixated on consultant led full multidisciplinary 24 seven support. Actually, what is it if that's not what you need, but you do need to be in a really supportive inpatient location. And I think that's really important to reference that because whilst everyone's needs are important, it, well, while people's wants and desires about where they die are important, we have to recognise the, the reality of what a hospice bed is and what is it for as currently set up. But thank you for your very kind comments at the beginning. That was my other second point. It's very motivating for the team to hear that feedback. So I really appreciate it. Well, that, thank you. And I, I meant it. And I think it is a way forward. And we, you know, at the, I think at the board, um, as well as the integrated care board, we should we should highlight this um, as a way of learning from the past, doing things differently now. So really, I meant it. Um, just on the hospice point, you talked quite specifically about the hospice provision that the NHS makes. What about charitable hospices? There's quite a, a, a network of them and children's hospices. So I should declare I used to have as a client some years ago. Um, they provide a different sort perhaps of wraparound care not as medical it depends on the hospice and on the on the people employed but they um they are where people want to go and it, it being too medical about it might mean that people don't have the happiest end of life that they want I don't think we're saying different things there. I think actually all of our charitable hospices in our patch, of which there are a number, obviously Royal Trinity being your closest, largely do provide that really complex care. We've done some audit work around what they currently provide, but we really hear the point about as a location, it feels very safe and holding for people who maybe don't have those complex needs. And how do we really build that into our work? And it, it isn't necessarily more of what we've got. It might be more of something different, which reflects that set of needs. Have said, well, does that mean that there might be funding from the NHS for those hospices as part of the total system? We already fund those hospices. So, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a question to make on behalf of Councillor Warby. She asked me to ask this question. Um, one of the reasons that uh, the report has for the closure of Pembridge uh, Palliative Care Centre was not being able to recruit um, specialist staff. So the question that Genevieve has is, uh, if you consider uh, recruiting a palliative consultant from abroad? So um, Sam is one of the um, medical team based out of um, Pembridge, but not covering the inpatient unit, covering the community teams. And I think it's really worth reflecting that when we talk about Pembridge, the majority of patient contacts there were never the inpatient beds. Pembridge is not closed. Pembridge has a day hospital. It has outpatients and it is the basis for a growing community team. So that was an aside point. Sorry. Um, talking to Sam about this. So um, we have... We have tried a number of different recruitment options. We haven't looked specifically overseas, but there was some work in, I think it was Northeast London, it might be Southeast around looking at that recruitment option that we've been able to learn from. But I think there's a real fundamental challenge now that would you, with a review hanging over the unit, and this is a real reason why we need to hurry up and get this work finished, would you take a job knowing that there's a review underway and there is not necessarily that security of the role going forward and that is feedback that we had earlier in recruitment cycles that this was a very if you if you search for palliative care in northwest london or kensington and chelsea or the pembridge unit it's very known this work is happening and so it's a difficult background to really recruit whether that is from overseas or in the UK. Let's check in with Sam again on that overseas recruitment and we can put something in writing afterwards because this was a corridor conversation about what could we do and I think we can probably give you a bit more, bit more detail. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, are there further questions? Please go ahead. I was just, uh, thanks, Chair. No I was just going to say one thing to Jane. I think the kind of words one uses when looking for a staff from abroad, which all the London Acute Trusts do all of the time, is quite important because what we're not doing is rushing to get something finished because we want to get something finished. What we want to do is to build a model which is sustainable. And we've mentioned a range of, for example, 
on the whole charitable hospices across northwest London, many of which are very good. Perhaps all of them are very good, for all I know, but many of them are. But if we're looking at, say, 2040, the demand will be much greater. The bed availability on in the hospices as they stand will actually not meet demand. So looking at staffing there, it's not a short-term fix for a consultant. It's a longer-term development. And that's important when across North West London, all of the other parts of the acute sector are rethinking how they work. And we should not be the one sector to say, this is how we do it. So we're going to stick like this. So longer thinking. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. I um, appreciate your time and coming uh, to the park this evening. Thank you for the report. Thank you for your contribution this evening. Uh, we've heard uh, some positive comments in terms of uh, how well uh, the aspect of co-production is going, which is good, and also some specific results of that engagement and the outcomes that it can bring. But on the other hand, I've also heard um, from contributions this evening from Meryl that uh, there's definitely uh, an appetite for uh, for more engagement, and I would definitely welcome the opportunity as well. Have some uh, key players in terms of uh, our and Fulham and, and the provision of services. So please, if there are further opportunities for 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 the engagement to happen, that would be very welcome, and uh, we will con continue to to monitor the process. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can we now please move on to agenda item um, number seven, 2023 medium term financial strategy. Uh, this item is for members to consider budget proposals for the councils uh, for council next year for 2023. This is a particular difficult time uh, more than in previous years. We want to thank you uh, and also thank officers in the finance department for the work they have put to formulate um, the, the proposals and uh, the presentations and the papers. So thank you very much. Uh, this evening we have presenting as well as uh, Supinder Tassi, Director of Finance. Thank you very much. We also have with us, um, is of course, Councillor Councillor Ree. Thank you for your time. And also we've got uh, Prakash any head of finance, social care, and public health, and also Lisa Retro supporting the, the, the process as a strategic director of social care. Okay, over to uh, Councillor Reilly. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I wanted to start by thanking everyone who's been involved in putting this budget together. I want to thank Sukvinder and the whole finance team who've kept a real laser like focus on all of the figures. I'd like to thank the uh, the cabinet members and the members of staff in the departments who've, who've gone through their budgets line by line with a fine tooth comb to uh, to try and find savings and efficiencies. Uh, doing that after 13 years of going through their budgets trying to find savings and efficiencies. It's no mean feat and they've done a fantastic job. Um, it's particularly remarkable work considering we only got the final figures for the local government uh, finance settlement two days before Parliament broke up for Christmas. Uh, and this is the fifth year in a row where we've just had a single year settlement from government. So it's having to having to make these budgets based on assumptions, based on based on best guesses. Uh, and uh, finance officers have done a fantastic job in uh, in putting this budget together. Um, and we've come to come up with a budget that I'm really proud of. Actually, um, it's a very difficult time to be trying to set a budget. Yeah, inflation. A couple of months ago, it was at over 11%. Even now, prices are going up at 10.5%. Uh, interest rates uh, were 0.1%. Uh, then in less than a year, they've shot up to 3.5%. That makes borrowing more expensive. Uh, and the Bank of England is predicting 
that later this year we're going to go into rece into recession, a the longest recession that we've seen for generations. Now that's going to have a huge impact on council finances. Firstly, because more people uh, are going to be relying on uh, on the council and council services because they're struggling, but also because it means it's going to have a knock on impact on uh, on on uh, the amount of people uh, giving the council money through fees and charges. So it's really going to put the squeeze on on the council, and uh, so that's made it difficult. Uh, to balance the budget. But that's something that we have done. Um, we're working under very tight, as I say, uh, financial conditions as well. Our grant has been cut since 2010. Our grant has been cut by 56% in real terms. So there aren't many organizations today that are expected to provide the same level of service that they were providing 13 years ago with less than half of the resources available. But not only are we doing that, not only are we providing that same level of service, but we've gone beyond that. We're doing even more. Uh, here in Hammersmith and Fulham, we've abolished uh, home care charges. We provide free breakfast for primary school children. We've maintained weekly bin collections. We have funded a new law enforcement team. And through our ethical debt collection policy, we've stopped using bailiffs to collect council debt from residents. Our priority has been protecting these services as we put this budget together. Uh, and I'm proud to say that we have managed to protect all of these frontline services that residents are relying on. Now, finally, I'm going to hand over to, to Sikvinda, who will be able to talk us through the detail of the budget. But uh, I've talked a lot about the difficult economic conditions that we're in at the moment. But economic conditions aren't just difficult for councils. They're very difficult for the residents that we're here to represent. And we know that and we recognise that. And that's why, as part of this budget, we've managed to find nearly a million pounds uh, to put towards a ring-fenced fund to help people struggling through the cost of living crisis. Um, so uh, those are the headlines, but I'm going to hand over to, to Sikvinda for the detail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, the papers that have been sent out to the members of the committee has got a report, a finance report that sets out some of the detail. Uh, I've got a very short presentation, 10 minutes or so at most. Uh, Councillor Ri, our cabinet members, eloquently set out the overall context, so I won't take the time to repeat some of the things that uh, the cabinet member has said, conscious of the time uh, that's precious for the committee. So I'll just run through those slides uh, for the committee. So Councillor Ria has explained, the, I don't think I'll spend too much time on, on those. I'll spend a bit of time setting out the budget strategy it wants to take forward for 23-24 and some of the key outcomes uh, from that. And then conclude by saying a few words on our reserves position and looking forward to the MTFS position uh, for 24-25. I can scarcely believe I'm already talking about 24-25 when we're looking at setting the budget for next year uh, in the first uh, instance. So the next slide talks about some of those issues that Councillor Ree has talked about. That will put enormous pressure on our residents and our delivery of our services. Uh, and of course, we've got the continued annual settlements from national government. They promised that they would move to a three-year settlement. It will help our financial planning. There are reviews of a number of financial frameworks that govern the council's finances, business rates, and the localization of those, and the social care financial reviews uh, overall. There are pressures on our demography overall. We've got more older people within the borough and they need to be taken care of and looked after. The council has got some very ambitious programs for building new homes, more than 12, uh, more than 3,000 homes for the next seven years, which is much needed uh, for the borough. And there are pressures on our services uh, as well. So just to say a little bit more than about our strategy, which has been about preserving the very services that Councillor Ree has talked about earlier. The Council provides, and I'm always amazed by that, uh, more than 60, 70 services across the piece, from waste collection, highway services, to registrar services, home care services, and a whole range uh, of those. They are valued by our residents, and we want to make sure that they are preserved as best as possible uh, overall. Councillor Ree again has talked about making sure that the key priorities for the Council continue to be preserved. There are a couple there mentioned, the free home care service and the weekly waste collection services. There are many uh, authorities in the land, members of the committee will know, where waste collection is undertaken once every three weeks, once every two weeks or so, even longer in some cases. But the council here will continue uh, to do that. The budget proposals overall, 
uh, allow us to invest almost 11 million pounds more in services. And I'll say a couple of words uh, about that uh, in a moment. Uh, with all that, it's very important that the finances are managed in a very uh, prudent way and that the council's resources are financially resilient overall. These are difficult times and we need to make sure that the finances there are well uh, taken care of. Just very briefly to say a few words about some of the principles that we've used to set the budget for 23-24. We're allowing for a 5% inflationary uplift on pay and prices. The Office for Budget Responsibility is looking at about 7.5% for the year. So that's a tad cautious, but I'm hoping that with the good work of the cabinet members, the procurement work, and the strategic directors and officers, we'll be able to manage that within that overall uh, program. Uh, council tax proposals, 3% and 2%. I'll say a couple of words about that in a moment. There are some modest savings in the budget overall, 2.9. They are more about how we procure services and how we work with our partners. An example that you saw earlier with our colleagues from the NHS. So it is really about making sure that we do that as well as we can. Ensuring our resilience by making sure that we continue to maintain some level of contingencies to allow against unforeseen issues that might uh, arise. And of course, the investment that we're doing, some of it is being undertaken through borrowing, and we're making sure that we're funding that overall. We're minimizing that because interest rates are high at the moment, and we don't want to undertake any more borrowing, and it's absolutely necessary for us to deliver uh, the investment that the council uh, wants to do uh, overall. As far as the council tax uh, uh, is concerned, uh, the council has got one of the lowest bandy tax levels in the country, £832 in 22-23. And for the past five years out of the last eight years, the council has been able to maintain a freeze or to keep uh, a reduction overall. Just as a general indication, a 1% increase in council tax will be about eight pounds or so uh, a year. But more importantly, only 53% of our residents will be expected to be that fully. Most of them will get either some sort of exemption. 11% of our residents will get support through the council tax support scheme, which most authorities these days ask for a contribution of at least 20% or so. And a third of our residents will be able to claim a single person discount of about 25% on that total uh, cost that you see there. But finally, just to say uh, a reminder, really, that the government, as part of the audit autumn statement and the chancellor's statement in November the 17th, made an assumption that really an expectation for local authorities to increase their council tax and to raise that council uh, tax precept. They took that into account in the grant settlements uh, that, uh, that they made. The next slide I want to uh, talk too much about, it just provides you an indication of really the key changes a monetary amount to those assumptions that we just talked about earlier. I'll just draw out uh, uh, one or two points uh, for that for members of the committee. Pay and price inflation, quite a substantial sum, 13.6 million. Almost 4.1 million of that, a third of it, will go towards helping adult and social care services to help our providers externally who are delivering services and to also support our employees by making sure that they get the pay award uh, that has been uh, agreed uh, overall. Um, the only other thing I would say is that just about the only thing that I can point to uh, with the fiscal uh, problems that the council suffered last autumn was that the interest rates that councillor re referred to means that we can generate a bit more interest on in our cash balances, which we're managing very prudently. That has helped us to balance our budget uh, overall, but that's a one-off. It won't be here forever. It will disappear uh, in, in, in future years. There's a little bit about the savings there. I won't labor the point on those, they're in the report, but it is about how we work with our partners in a more collaborative way, how we procure things more efficiently and how we do those uh, more carefully. Uh, we have got some savings that we'll make on the level of uh, wish tonnages that the council generates. That's the awareness programs that the council is running with residents. So that's helping to reduce, to reduce those. But to say a little bit about the growth uh, in total that the council and the investment that will be put into services, 10.7 million uh, will go in. Uh, again, uh, the details are on the slide there, but just to mention that if fair proportion of that, almost 40%, 4.1 million, will go towards supporting social care to help with the hospital discharges and to help with the demography and the elderly 
population uh, overall. Uh, I think I'm really pleased that the council has been able uh, to do that cabinet member and uh, all cabinet to support that overall. We will ensure that we try to manage within that overall resources uh, that we've got that we've got there. Just a couple of final words really on our on our reserves position. Uh, in these difficult times, I'm hoping that all members of the committee will agree it's important to keep something in reserve to allow us to deal with uh, unforeseen uh, circumstances. We've got those, and I consider our reserves to be uh, at an adequate level. We are comparable to other local authorities in London. Our reserves are about 26% of our gross spend. They were 18 months or so ago, and they will continue uh, at that. And from my perspective, uh, I recommend that at least the council maintains some free balances, general balances of between 19 and 25% million or so. And that's what we've got currently. It, it looks a big number, but it's not really that big in the scale of the numbers earlier that we, we talked about. It just takes a little bit of something to go wrong and you've dipping into all those uh, overall. And we will be using some of our reserves in the new year to make sure that some of the work that we need to do will be continued and completed. Uh, IT upgrade, particularly, we do that every three years or so to make sure that we continue to make sure that our residents can access our services in a very easily and uh, accessible way and to make sure that they are safe and operating well for overall our systems. Just finally, to say a couple of words about the MTFS. I think Councillor Rhea has indicated that the operating environment will continue to be difficult overall uh, with the public finances. Yes. Uh, the inflation le levels will come down a shade, but they will still be 7.5% uh, at least uh, or so. Uh, we're going to work on the basis that 3% only uh, is affordable for pay and prices uh, for the future, and we'll bring that down a bit further in future years. And there will be pressures for us, the demographic pressures, follow the census, and so that we will need to accommodate uh, within that. And already a bit of a headache uh, for us all uh, in the finance community and for the cabinet member, we're looking at a, at a budget gap for uh, 24, 25 of 70 million. But I know that uh, members, residents, and officers will work together to come with a, a pragmatic package and a solution to deal with that uh, too. And just finally, a couple of words about what happens next. We're taking all the budget proposals to all the uh, account accountability committees during this week and next week. And cabinet will meet on the 6th of February to look at the detailed proposals uh, in more uh, in, and consider those. And then, of course, there'll be full budget council on the 23rd of February uh, to hopefully approve uh, the budget proposals uh, that are put forward for 23 24. Uh, Chair, with that, I, I'll stop and pause. Thank you so much, uh, Supinder, for the detailed presentation. Thank you very much as well to uh, Councillor Rhee, Cabinet Member of Finance for the headlines as well um, and and for, for the information that you've shared with us today this evening. Have we got questions from members of the batch? Um, given that as a borough we're, we're quite deprived in the in the number of homeless people we have um, the number of people coming into Borough, the, the, the poor state of housing. Now, the government is talking about this levelling up, but it never seems to level up to areas like ours. It seems to go to nice leafy suburbs. Why is this? And, and surely the, the, you know, the Association of Local Authorities and things are there, are there any representations being made to the uh, Treasury about this? And, and what is their response? And how do they how do they view boroughs like ours? Do you want to comment initially, in uh, Councillor Rhea, uh, and I'll make a comment too from an office perspective? Uh, I, I will do, yes. I, um, I think there are certain things that um, maybe officers won't be able to say that, that, that I can. Um, well, I think sadly the answer is is politics, right? Yeah, you know, um, I think a lot of the a lot of the money uh, that is distributed through schemes like the Leveling Up Fund, we've we've seen in in recent days uh, with some of the news stories about this, don't often go to the places that need them most. They go to the place where they need people to vote Conservative most, um, and uh, yeah, I think they've decided that. Parts of London are, are, aren't necessarily going to do that, so there's no point in them giving us any extra money. Uh, that would that would be my my political answer to it. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. People 
people think of London, people outside London perhaps think of London as being, uh, you know, a very wealthy place, a place where um, lots of wealth is generated, uh, certainly the part of the country where the most wealth is generated. But, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to take those people around uh, Becklow Gardens in my ward, you know, it's, it's a place where uh, you do see um, people who are really struggling to get by. Uh, and that's the case, you know, across the borough. I'm, I'm sure Councillor Coleman uh, would, would say the same about parts of his ward as well. Um, the, the response we get isn't, isn't a particularly good one, and that means we have to work even harder to try and make sure that our money goes as far as possible. We have to work as hard as possible as we can to make sure that it's targeted in the, the best, best places. Uh, and that's what we've been trying to do for the last, uh, the last nine years, and that's what we're going to carry on doing. Thank you. Just come back and say, well, I, I hope that when we put the figures out to people, that we will say where the real blame lies and put in some, a point in about the levelling up and that there are areas which are getting the levelling up, which are in much better off than we are, because the public will say, ah, it's the bloody council, and it's not... And it, it, this is the message we have to get across to people. Sorry to be political. <laughs> Not at all. I, feel, I think you make a very good point. And uh, yeah, it's, perhaps it's, it's up to people like me and Councillor Coleman to, to get out there and make that point. Um, but I'll, I'll hand over to him. Yeah, I can just, if I can just come in on that. Um, I don't think there's a single person in the country who thinks that the money that they're having to spend, whether it's going to be on council tax or... or come April, the increase in mortgages when the fixed rates end is in any way not due to the Conservative government. I think that although Rowan and I are very glad to go out and knock on doors and we do it regularly and we'll continue to do so, I think the people we're talking to have already pretty much established it. What I what I um what you'll find in looking at our budget is this year we are we Jeremy Hunt stood up and said I'm going to take difficult decisions. He may take more difficult decisions in two weeks or three weeks. The last difficult the difficult decision he took on home care financing was to ask councils to take the decision. And we've taken that we have taken the difficult decision this year. We we continue to up, as you'll hear, free home care in this borough and will continue to do so. It's a proud, one of our proudest commitments. Um, but we've had to take the 2%. We've taken the difficult decision. But I, I think our residents who are facing, obviously, as Rowan talked about, and that's why we've put a million pounds aside and doing other things, a cost of living crisis, they nonetheless understand that we have less money and we're going to have to raise the council tax. And a lot of people have said that they would expect us to do so. Mind you, they've said in previous years and we still haven't had to, but we're taking the difficult decision, um, which Mr. Hunt um, has kindly devolved to us. It's the only devolution they're doing, really. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Your head is... um, thank you for the presentation. It was grim realism, but it was also quite heartening. And I think the two actually were in tension because what was heartening is that so much of the budget which th this council is going for is protecting people who otherwise would not be at all protected. And I think that's something which the council can take real pride in. And I say that as somebody who's not in a political party and our chair would not want to play politics, but I think when the council sends out its, its budget demand to people, you need to say, in the simplest possible English, how well you're protecting those who are vulnerable. You need to say in the simplest possible English that the government is making it almost, almost, not impossible, but almost impossible to protect people who need protecting. So people know that it's not the council which is, um, is to blame for what isn't going right. I think that's of fundamental importance. It must be in, in very, very, um, blunt, simple English. And I think the commitment to continue over the next couple of years, which you've gone to and the uh, the median uh, term budget, you need to explain that, that it's impossible to maintain that unless the government steps up and does some of its civic duty, which has been disinclined to do for 12 years on austerity. Um, they have to play their part. Uh, just one question, when I read the papers today, I was not quite clear about what particular demographic pressures they were. And I know population changes a lot, it changes in my street very often, it's probably a typical Fulham street, but are there particular demographic pressures 
you'd like to draw attention to. Thank you, Chair. Chair, through you, um, I, I can certainly make an observation on the last comment. So the recent census that was completed has highlighted some uh, key trends uh, for the borough. But one of the most significant ones is that our population above 55 will be increasing significantly over the next uh, few years. And that will lead to extra demands on our services that we've got. I think that's the key one that I'll highlight. The council is working with other local authorities in London uh, to discuss those issues with central government overall. Thank you very much. If I could just come in and there, and um, thank you very much for those uh, those comments, particularly the, the the kind words about the the good work that we're doing. Um, as I say, I want to to thank the officers who've done such such good work to make sure that we've been able to protect those people who need protecting most. Um, and it's really down to the hard work that that we've been putting in, but also our ruthlessly financially efficient approach and you know, making sure that we can squeeze spending in areas where perhaps it's not so essential as much as possible so that we've got more money left over to help those who really do need it. Um, I also think um, really good advice, I think, on, in terms of the, the comms piece around this. So uh, we'll certainly take that on board and um, try and make sure that that's reflected in any communication that we do about the budget. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. Um, I have a question, please. Um, so in the report, this reference to the white paper, people at the, the heart of care and, and understand that there has been a delay in in the in this paper uh, until 2025. My question is, um, what impact does that have in terms of uh, our local provision? Please. Uh, thank thank you, uh, uh, Councillor. Um, I think in terms of the in terms of the reform around the uh, the um, fair cost of care, which is part of the reform package, um, it's actually helpful. Um, that that's going to be delayed for a couple of years. What's unhelpful is the decision, um, the long-term funding decision for social care, um, because we continue to depend upon uh, last-minute short-term funding, which, of course, we're happy to receive, but it's very difficult to plan. And as, as um, Councillor Ree and Savindra have outlined, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to put plans in place when we're constantly uh, having to, um, you know, depend upon uh, very last minute, um, whether that be the, you know, determination around the whole budget or social care budget. So um, I would say uh, both pluses and minuses really with it in terms of delivering the fair cost of care without any guarantee of having more money, I think would have been um, extremely, uh, extremely difficult. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Yes, it does. Okay, are there, are there further uh, comments, questions? Um, of course. Um, I have a comment. It's not really a question. Um, and the, the comment is, it's on Appendix 3. Uh, it's about special education needs. Um, and it just talks about the funding that's been set aside for children transitioning to adult social care and autistic autism diagnoses. Um, just to say there are massive, massive delays still in this area. Um, so whatever figure you have is probably not an accurate figure. So I, I agree with you in terms of it's a moving situation, uh, but we work closely in collaboration with our children's colleagues and the LD transitions team around that quite regularly. We have, uh, and we're working across economy as well in terms of need, particularly on the housing side of things as well. So what we've got in this paper is an initial uh, bid based on residents anticipated to come through from adult from children to adults. Mm -hmm. There are some that are very high cost that we are working further on. So we put those into risks. There isn't a budget provision for that at the moment, but this is reviewed very regularly, to be honest, with the uh, commissioners, the service and finance collectively across yeah. the piece. So the, real, the eyes are on it right the way through. And we're, uh, we're supporting, you know, in terms of need and reviewing those needs. I think I, think I was just hoping that maybe more funding could be put towards... Uh, people to carry out the assessments because because of the delays um, 
impacts as I, in both um, uh, transitioning to adult social care and autism assessments, because if there was if there were more staff to carry out the assessments, they would happen more quickly. Well, it was just, it was just uh, if I, if, sorry. Sorry, could I just make a comment on what you've just said? Um, the assessments that also has an impact on when the families try to claim the DLA for kids. Until they've got the assessment, there's no help, additional help for the families. So and and, and PIP. Point. And PIP. If you have an, an ASD assessment, you're more likely to get PIP. So they, they're really good, they're really good uh, comments. And I think the best thing that uh, Sukhvinder Prakash and I could do is take that back and we'll discuss that, discuss that further because they're very, you know, that's the reason for bringing this here to have that have this discussion and listen to what's been said. Okay, well, if there are no further comments or questions, I want to thank uh, Councillor Reed, Binder, Prakash, and Lisa for um, your. Um... Oh, yes, of course. Oh, I, beg, I beg your pardon. Please, please go ahead. We've now gone through the overall council's budget. Yes. Lisa, the strategy director for social care, and Prakash will go through a bit more of the detail about some of the issues that members of the committee raised. So hopefully that will help you uh, with some of the discussion. I think Prakash and Lisa. Yes, I want to say well, thank you so much. I think uh, what we need to, uh, I mean, we've, we've heard from um, members of the party this evening how well we really appreciated that this budget uh, protects those very important services that very vulnerable people, the most vulnerable people in our community need. So it's it's really good to hear that uh, this continuation of those services as well, this protection, and also that this growth as well as part of that uh, proposal that you've you've submitted. So thank you very much. And we're now here from uh, the specifics about social care. Just waiting for the uh, presentation to to load. But um, whilst we're waiting for that, uh, I. Uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about social care and public health and I think a good place to start um yes the focus is is on is on money um, but I thought you'd like to hear a bit about um how we've spent it and uh, and how we plan to spend it in the future so looking at our vision our priorities and our challenges really mindful of time so I won't um I won't go through every single line. So next slide, please, if that. Uh, learning disabilities and those with autism, um, day support, short breaks and provision, which enable people to live independently. And again, uh, one of our assistant directors, Joe Beatty, uh, in conjunction with uh, local residents, um, people who use these services, developing an autism strategy as well. So that touches a little bit on the SEND um, area that you're talking to. So we've got a lot of work to do in that area across adults and uh, young people services and we recognise that. Um, we've got to focus on the new care quality assurance regime, uh, which will be introduced in April 2023. And really, we started planning for that many, many months ago. Um, social services haven't been inspected in their entirety for about 11, 12 years. Certain provider services have, but not the whole social services department. So a lot of work's got to continue in that ar arena. Um, management 
of market sustainability since uh, COVID, uh, an already volatile market has become even more uh, destabilized, coupled, coupled with cost of care uh, and uh, sorry, cost of living and so on that's put further pressure on market sustainability. We, this council and ourselves, we need, know we need to continue to improve the quality of our home care. So we, we provide free home care, but the quality of it, we need to keep working on. And that's something certainly Councillor Coleman and the cabinet and all councillors are very committed to. Um, so, so that's a, an on, ongoing piece of work, I would say. We talked a little bit earlier about our integrated care partnership, and I know people like uh, Jim and Merrill are very much involved in, in, in our uh, local integrated care partnership and our wider integrated care system across Northwest London. So that's another area that we've got to continue to work on. Um, and we talked about our medium term financial strategy. In terms of our achievements, so how we've, what's, I suppose, spending some of the monies enabled us to uh, maintain free care at home to 2,251 older and disabled residents, maintaining free daycare, short stay support and transport. It's worth remembering that uh, alongside free care, which has been in situ since 2015, We've, we also provide this community, free community care services. Most authorities do not do that. Um, I think that if you surveyed most of uh, most councils, they charge for all their community care services. We've maintained our low cost of a meals and a chat service, previously known as Meals on Wheels, for the eighth year in a row. They cost two pounds. Uh, per person. They do not cost the council two pounds per person. They cost significantly more than that. And uh, for the seventh year in a row, we've not increased our care line charge. Our reablement service has been awarded outstanding by the Care Quality Commission for the third time in a row. This is amazing. Um, <clears throat> I think we're in the top 4% in the country in terms of reablement services. You hear in the news every single day about delayed discharges and what to do about them. Um, reablement services are a way of uh, preventing delayed discharges, but they're also, uh, it, the reablement service is also a way of getting people back on their feet and making sure that we don't um, add to the long-term care bill um, <clears throat> that's, that's, uh, that, that we're currently, that's currently being created by the amount of people needing hospital care and coming through the hospital system. Uh, we continue to pay our contractors and subcontractors the London Living Wage, and we check that we're, the money is actually going to carers through payroll checks. And again, this is something that Councillor Coleman picks me up on in, uh, and in our regular briefing sessions to check that we are paying, that the money is actually going to the carers and not to the companies. Um, if we don't do that, we don't know. So I think it's, it's great that we have a lot of scrutiny on that. Um, we're protecting residents. We're supporting 532 residents in care homes and working closely with care providers on the cost of living impact. And Hammersmith and uh, Fulham are along the, uh, uh, has been for many, many years among the leading boroughs in London for timely discharges, relieving some of the intense pressures on the uh, NHS. This is absolutely amazing. Uh, I don't think in my what, 35 years in, in local government have I seen in this last year the amount of people going into hospital, coming out of hospital, needing very uh, complex care. It's both the higher demand and the acuity, which we've talked on, talked about many times at, at, this, at this committee. And um, I think another of our great achievements is that we've achieved um, to date from last April, we, we measured them April to April, 200 compliments. Um, so I feel that's a real achievement. Social care isn't often a service that gets complimented. So I think that that's, that's a real achievement. Um, and then in terms of our challenges, uh, speedier hospital discharges means that we're supporting more and more people um, and they require more intensive support for a longer period of time. As I've said, we've mentioned around increasing demographic and demand pressures. Um, and again, uh, Jim, on your um, question, we can circulate the new census information with the minutes because I think you'll find that helpful. Um, 
we've got a growing cost of uh, younger people transitioning from to over to adult services and we've got the impact of cost of living pressures on care market providers so on top of infl inflation and price increases some of our, some of our providers are saying how are you going to help us cope with like many businesses um <clears throat> cost of living pressures so that's something that we have to work on support uh providers with but it's something we haven't got um you know it's a difficult uh circle to square um i've mentioned uh about the dependency on short-term funding and um actually I, I think i've been talking about this or involved in this for about 20 years the dill not commission came out in 2011 we're still talking about it um and really until a longer term sustainable way of funding uh social care is found i think we'll find ourselves in this predicament every single year and it's quite grim actually um i think to treat people in such an appalling way um so we we obviously don't value as a society um our older people and, and disabled people um sufficiently to work out how we're going to fund uh, support for them so i think it's it's quite an appalling state of affairs really so my comment um i'm not saying that that's um as a as a as a das yeah okay so can i carry on or do you want to take the question okay so um on the on the money side uh so this little colorful pie chart here it gives you an idea of the plans for next year for social care in terms of the gross expenditure budget so 105 million that's proposed uh this year is 95 million so it's going up by 10 million or 10.4 million to be precise so there's quite a significant investment coming into the social care market uh Savinda's alluded on terms of the investment coming in across the council 4.1 million is coming to social care proposed uh, we are concerned about demographics. We have done modelling. We've worked with our business intelligence. So some of that money will be to do with the demographic increases. Some of that is the existing hospital pressures that Lisa just alluded to. We, we've been funding it, but one-off measures. So now we, we've got to do with a base budget adjustment to deal with that side of things. 3.4 of the inflation that's set aside for the council is coming to social care. That's 5% that uh, Savinda's alluded to. 5% is going to be a challenge in our market. It's been a challenge this year in terms of cost of living and so on and so forth. It will be next year, even with a projected 7.4% increase. But we talk to the providers, we negotiate with the providers, we work through, we go through their accounts and so on and so forth. So it's a dialogue that has been going on since COVID, kind of thing around that. But it is it will be a challenge. And Lisa's alluded to some sh short-term funding. We do have some short-term funding, 2.9 million for next year. Uh, of new government grants for uh, market sustainability. So that is again, working with providers around fair cost of care, and also the discharge pressures ongoing from hospital around that. The colorful pie, uh, if you look at it from the, the, the external providers, most of our money, uh, 70 odd percent, is spent out in the market with care providers. So we are providers where we send that out for care, care in care in a community or care in care homes or we give direct payments out so the majority of our money is spent out there uh, but we also have a range of in-house services reaiment being the largest one uh, in the in-house sector uh, we spend quite a bit of money on the third sector community 5.5 million and also supporting people mental health services if you take those four together that's 90 million or, or uh, 85 percent of the budget is predominant all on care to run for frontline resident services. So the rest of it will be the assessment staff or support charges uh, for, for, for running the services. Next slide is to give you a little bit of flavor of the trends over the last few years in our, in our business. And uh, in terms of home care, I think we've touched on it already in terms of there's been a significant increase, particularly over the last two years, but over the last Last year, it's a 14% increase in spend. And predominantly, that is to do with the speedier hospital discharge, the acuity of need, and the London Navy wage pressures, which obviously will go up again next year by about nine, eight, nine percent On the acuity point, after that 14%, 9% of that relates to acuity of need. And that is residents getting more than 14 hours per week of care. 
services kind of thing around that. And that's an increasing trend. So that's that's the kind of green green line there. The uh, the yellow line is on care homes. So there was clearly, sadly, the dip in COVID times in terms of placement numbers going down and sadly from deaths. But since then, numbers have gone back up. And uh, in the last year, there's a 13% increase in uh, care homes, again, to do with acuity or uh, greater hospital discharge and acuity of need. But the, the price inflation there is quite high. We have to negotiate. We've got block contracts. We've got spot contracts. We are negotiate. We negotiate well. But the average, we're competing with everybody else. We're competing with our NHS colleagues. We're competing with our neighbours, kind of thing around that. So the average this year is a 10% uplift in price within that 13% increase. So price is a significant factor. In, in in terms of the, le the last year or so. Kind of on direct payments, fairly steady increase uh, year on year. We want to do more on direct payments. Mm. I'm going to invite to, to Dr. Lang who's on the line to go through the achievements for public health. Thanks, Prakash. So as we came out of uh, the COVID pandemic in the spring of last year, we were hit with numerous other health protection challenges so you'll remember monkeypox, now called mpox, and then a summer in which uh, we had to tackle different things like polio vaccinations, diphtheria vaccinations, scabies, norovirus, and then streptococcus A in children in the winter. So this ties nicely in with our investment in infection prevention and control and health protection. We have a very senior um, nurse in the council who's leading innovative work in our care homes, setting up um, as good, if not better, environmental audits going into nursing homes, inspecting them from top to bottom and creating bespoke systems to mirror the CQC inspection process. I think what's unique about our infection control offer, which is going to expand as well, is that our training and education really involves the staff and we, we train staff, including the cleaners, which sometimes people overlook. But if you can imagine for infection control, cleaners are absolutely essential. So we do teaching around chemicals, um, how to prepare them and how to clean, which sounds mundane, but it's actually super exciting. Um, we've done collaborative working with housing and the economy, creating an easy read guide to housing and employment services for the NHS. The NHS sometimes find it hard to navigate and that resource is used by um, primary care. So that means GPs hospitals and the mental health trusts so that they can easily refer in if they have um, a patient with damp and mold in their house or even a patient who needs a better job or um, is looking for new careers. For our hostels in Hammersmith and Fulham, we have um, 150 very vulnerable people plus um, others living in temporary accommodation. We are going to be building a bespoke model of specialist mental health in reach for very complex people. I think someone mentioned rough sleepers earlier they often have concomitant mental health and drug um, issues. So they're complex in some ways to manage. So we're building something that we think is really innovative in parallel with a physical health offer as well, so that they have nurses for their mental health and also for their physical health. Um, and our suicide rates in the borough, we have published a suicide prevention needs assessment, and we're now digging into much more detailed work around um, auditing people who have self-harmed and presented to accident and emergency and working out um, suicide reporting systems so that we can think about prevention um, at every stage. And the last bullet point is about our joint strategic needs assessment, um, which is uh, easier to use, providing shorter, more factual reports that commissioners and residents can also use to get a picture of the borough. Thanks very much, back to Prakash. So the, the last slide is on the public health grant, which is a ring fence grant to the council of 23.3 million. This is this year's figure. Uh, we're still waiting. We anticipate mid-February to get next year's grant condition and values across. No, no authority knows at the moment on that. So in terms of the spend plan, uh, we spend quite, you know, we've got major contracts that we manage within the commissioning team under Dr. Lang, under for families and children services. So that's mainly to do with school nursing and visiting health visiting for behavioral change for substance misuse services we're looking at that contract at the moment as we talk and streamlining that arrangement 
Uh, and then we have something called the Public Health Investment Fund, which is where services we public health fund across the council. Uh, so we have, for example, quite a bit of investment going into the environment department uh, to do with environmental health officers. We have quite a bit of investment going into the economy department on housing and homelessness. We talked about that earlier, but there's quite a bit of investment from public health to homelessness down there. Children get quite a bit through early help and education, and adults get services that funded uh, from public health grant as well. So it is an all-round managed across the council, this kind of service uh, under Dr Lang's uh, directorship comes around that. The £23.3 million pound plan at the moment, but we get, we expect to get a little bit more for inflation, which we'll meet, which we need to go to meet public health outcomes. That's it. For me. Thank you very much, um, Ricard, Lisa, uh, as, as well as Dr. Lang, uh, for your uh, presentations. Um, have you got questions, comments, members of the, of the panel? Yes, sorry. Yes, Meryl, please. Um, it's a quick comment, really. Um, Lisa, speaking, I think, for an awful lot of residents in Hammersmith and Fulham, we value you, your department, public health, and the council for the absolutely amazing work you've done and for things like adult so social care coming without a cost to those who are cared for. Um, a friend of Jim's and mine has a neurological problem that has become worse and worse and worse so that she can only move with one of those chairs and she lives in a flat that's upstairs that has two floors upstairs. We saw her only just before Christmas. And almost the first thing she said to us was, the council just came and put this in and I didn't have to pay a penny. She was overwhelmed and absolutely thrilled, and it has enabled her to stay at home and continue her work as, as an artist who has produced some amazing work as an artist. And I did want to say that as a thank you to this borough for the amazing work that they do. I'd just like to add to that. As people here know, Jim and I run, together with a few others, the local Save Our, Save Our NHS campaign. But we are also affiliated as a campaign to keep our, keep our NHS public, which is a national campaign. And constantly, Hammersmith and Fulham is held up as a as an amazing example of a local authority who has actually taken amazingly positive steps in terms of adult social care by making social care free at the point of delivery. So on behalf of local residents and of other national campaigns, thank you, you are appreciated. Crikey, I don't know how to how to respond to that other than you say I'm a bit to. over. I, I can't. I cannot. But um, I um, those were beautiful, beautiful words, and and thank you very much. Thank you. And thank we're you. very well supported by people like yourself and by Jim and by our wonderful councillors as well. Thank you very much for those wonderful words. I think it's fantastic to hear the feedback. And I think it makes us, me, very proud to be part of this administration and the commitment that it has supporting our residents. So that's very, very uh, uh, welcome and very valuable. Thank you very much. Jim. Uh, uh, well, thanks, Chair. It's, it's a tiny comment. I really was taken by the, uh, by the work on discharge that we have one of the best records in London. We've heard that from Professor Tim Orchard, 
the CEO of Imperial, uh, unsolicited at meetings with him. And we've also read the ICB papers. One thing does occur to me, the ICB is a reality or is moving towards being a reality. I'm wondering about the, how shall I say it, the nudge or pressure power that this council can bring to, to bear so that other councils emulate what you're doing on discharge, which would actually relieve pressure on whole swathes of the local acute sector, because what you're doing works, and we know other councils are lagging very sadly behind, and we would not like to lose anything of what you're doing, and were other councils to do similar, um, affecting what will be a difference but their own population, I think health outcomes for so many across Northwest London would improve. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. If I can respond, and I don't know if um, Councillor Coleman wants wants to say anything as, as well, but I think it's a com thank, thank you for that. I think it's a combination of um, managing performance well and working well as a system. And I think it's about publicising how and what we do um, as uh, directors uh, across London, but also nationally. I think it's we talked about reablement earlier i would like uh so much more reablement i would like our and we're trying to engender it our home care service to have a reablement um ethos really and that's going to require a lot more training but if we can get nhs partners to invest in that even more and then indeed some of the short-term funding that we've been given we will invest more in that because getting people back on their feet not only enables people to live independently, gives them a better quality of life, but reduces the need for long-term care for some people um, and reduces the amount of long-term care. The other, the other big uh, difference is free home care. An awful lot of people will receive their six weekly free home care when they come out of hospital across the country. But at the end of that six, uh, that six week period, whether a person needs care or not, people will often vote with their pocket and particularly, well, even more so at the moment with the cost of living crisis, people won't buy their care. So that means that the discharge has become more problematic or people end up back in hospital because they've not been cared for properly at home. Uh, we've not got all the quality elements right. I'd be the first one to say that. Um, we offer a lot more care, so that has its own capacity issues and training and so on. But um, I think those are the those are the three ingredients that I would sum up. You know how to do good discharge, really. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I, I just had one um, quick health question. I, I just wanted to ask about what um, what steps you're taking to reduce the high suicide rates. So when we had a look at our suicides in the borough, we looked at coroner data and we found that two thirds were in people with either a mental health problem or a drug and alcohol problem. And we know that we have an incredibly vulnerable subset of the population living in homeless hostels who by dint of having a drug and alcohol problem and mental health problem at the same time so they're self-medicating for the distress they're not always getting easy access to mental health services so that's why we're building this in reach model we're hoping it's going to completely revolutionize what these people experience so having really joined up services and we're hoping that makes a significant dent into suicides um, and there are other actions that we're taking. So some of it is looking at the data more. So it sound, doesn't sound earth shattering, but we're trying to look at everyone who has self-harmed and gone to A&E. Are they having the NICE guidelines? So National Institute for Healthcare, are they being followed up afterwards? So that's a really important piece of work because as you know, if someone has self-harmed, they're at much higher rate, um, risk of suicide later. So we've got an action plan with about eight subsets of recommendations. So we've got lots of things. So some of it is preventative in schools, making sure that children have um, sort of 
mental health support that catches problems early. Some is around incredibly vulnerable people, making sure they get the right specialist support. And some is about awareness and anti-stigma work. So happy to send the, the link to you on that. Okay, because I, I, I know that CAMS is very difficult to access um, as is Mint currently. So um, I, I'd, I'd welcome that information. Thank you. Helpful. Thank you. Just, to, just, I just add to that, we're doing a, a lot on suicide. I agree that it's quite it's really taken very seriously um the, the, we looked at the suicide rates um for this borough which are high and too high the leaders made it a priority and the strategy nikki nikki's probably so nikki's so bad at selling herself but the work that she's doing and the way she's bringing people together and the strategy that's going to come up with i hope when it comes to this committee you'll be you'll be reassured that it's something we're taking very seriously indeed Make a couple of comments to chair on the on the um on the report. First of all, just on the public health. Um, I do think it's as I said, we have some we have some incredible officers, not just about public health. You see tonight that we have incredible officers. We are very, very blessed. We have a, we talk about being a council which wants to be compassionate and a council that wants to be ruthlessly financially efficient, and we get that in our officers, but we also get passionate. And I think you've seen that tonight. Um, and passion about the people that we're here to support drives everything but we we are at the same time you can be you can be passionate and useless <laughs> we, have, we have officers who are passionate compassionate financially ruthlessly efficient very very good at what they do and i think i i feel very lucky um with my sort of naggy questions and stuff to them um that we're able to deliver year on year what we're able to do the and 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 lisa and prakash are two of the most i think they must be two of the best officers that we have in london and i know i'm, I'm not dissing any other dasses distas um i'm not doing any other directors of social care but they you know jim there's a lot in there's a lot in producing free home care that is also about getting not just the big the big picture but getting down to the nitty-gritty and that's something that also these officers do exceptionally well and and, and when the labor party and people from other boroughs come to us and ask how we do it the one thing i i can really never say is i don't know how good your directors are i don't know how good your officers are because you need to clone these two <laughs> that's the real way of doing it uh, when it comes to, to public health i think also we have the most extraordinary practitioner in nikki lang who is as I, underplays herself consistently i mean when she says something like um yes we're making sure that in care homes all the staff getting um infection control training it's exceptional she says things where you think, yeah, that makes sense. But people don't do it like that. When we closed the care homes, um, when, the, when the government was pushing people out into, into them during COVID, um, Nikki went in and made sure that everyone who wasn't symptomatic got tested every day, as well as everyone who was. No one else was doing that at the time. That all the staff were tested regularly. No one else was doing that at the time. Um, the fact that she's produced it just on the slide there, a little guide for the NHS on how to access housing and social care. This isn't done. It's when you when it's done. It's one of those things that you go, yeah, common sense. But nobody does this sort of thing. So we're very lucky in having somebody who just says, "Oh, that should be done," and then <laughs> somehow the next day it is, and very firmly. So very clear thinking, exceptionally modest but exceptionally good. We are. I feel very lucky as a cabinet member. I can just sit here and take credit for all the incredibly nice things that Merrill and other people have said because of the officers that we work with. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, th thank you so much. I um, think uh, just to reiterate, uh, uh, thanks for um, your uh, paper this evening and for your presentations. Um, fantastic to hear of the public health achievements from Dr. Lang, and we've just heard from Councillor Coleman about the fantastic work done. We've also heard about the suicide strategy plan that we've got uh, um, in, in, in plan as well. We've also heard about uh, the social care achievement. I think it's fantastic to know that uh, Hamilton and Fulham can continue to provide care at home for disabled people and older residents. Uh, we can continue as well to subsidize charges for the daily meals and a chat and the care line services. Also a council that uh, has got that commitment to pay uh, the, the contractors and subcontractors the London living wage, which makes a massive impact in the current cost of living crisis for, for Londoners. Also, to learn of the fantastic um, outcome of the reablement service 
and the um, outstanding rating by the Care Quality Commission and the preventative work that they do in terms of supporting patients. Uh, last week at full council, we actually had a motion and, and this was mentioned a few times. So this is something to be very proud of and, and celebrate. Uh, thank you, Sal Prakash, for all the detailed information on the, ha the hard work with, with this department. It's, it's greatly appreciated. So if there are no further questions or comments, uh, we can move on to the next agenda. And thank you very much. Can I 